and welcome to the BLSI philosophy series on the meaning of existence, being and becoming. My name is Andreas Vasmut and I'm the co-convener for philosophy at the BLSI. Uh, today we'll be exploring part four of the meaning of existence, being and becoming and the period from the Renaissance to modern philosophy. This title is somewhat misleading as I will not cover the period of the Renaissance from a philosophical perspective. Clearly there have been many important figures in this period of history such as Michelangelo, Raphael, Leonardo da Vinci, Machiavelli, Luther, Copernicus, but its focus was on the Renaissance or rebirth of antiquity. I also won't cover subsequent giants of thought and philosophy here such as Francis Bacon and the scientific method, Galileo Galilei, René Descartes, Thomas Hobbes, not forgetting Isaac Newton, Blaise Pascal, Gottlieb, uh, Gottfried uh, Leibniz, Spinoza and Bishop George Berkeley. The reason for not doing so is simply that I want to focus on the exploration of the meaning of existence, uh, which these thinkers uh, are not uh, uh, particularly known for and weren't particularly interested in. So just a very brief recap uh, on our journey so far. We started off in, in part one with exploring uh, the transition from ritual to religion, which is basically as a result of uh, uh, creating order out of chaos through common tenets, scriptures and the celebration of the divine. The, a purpose and the meaning of existence was based on revelation and faith rather than just being part of the community. You had to have certain uh, obligations and certain beliefs in order to, to be part of that community. In part two, we move from revelation to philosophy and philosophy as the love of wisdom. We explored how the early philosophers uh, had a sense of wonder at existence itself and uh, which transitioned with the advent of people like Socrates into a rational inquiry. And, and we discussed the, the notion of the unexamined life is not worth living uh, and which spawned lots of other schools of philosophy in antiquity that explored uh, what rationality and logical thought uh, and inquiry uh, actually consisted in. Uh, and then finally in part three we actually went east uh, to both India and into China where we experienced the universal reality of Brahman and Atman, the role of duty and our place in the world from which values and virtues arise, the importance of flowing according to nature in Taoism and effortless action and the message of universal inclusive and impartial care in Moism expressed both in thought and in deed. But today we are making a swift return to Western philosophy and going to explore various uh, schools, various notions, various concepts in, in modern philosophy, uh, starting with liberalism. Now the key proponents of liberalism uh, were in the in the 17th and 18th century uh, John Locke, Adam Smith and others uh, in the later centuries like Thoreau uh, and we'll be covering really just the key tenets of liberalism uh, uh, which which made a big impact in terms of our cultural heritage to the present day. And and in particular we start off with inalienable human rights. Here we see a return to the individual. Liberalism focuses very much on the individual, uh, the individual's rights and obligations uh, rather than the collective. So it is a very sort of atomic uh, philosophy starting with the individual and then branching out. The individual is at the centre and it is the notion of liberty and freedom that is most fundamental uh, within liberalism and also played a big role. You see the uh, Liberty Bell here on the right hand side in terms of the formation of the United States, uh, both uh, in terms of the Declaration of Independence as well as the American Constitution. 
Now, this quote is actually from another philosopher in utilitarianism, John Stuart Mill, much later on, but actually it also applies very much in terms of the liberal uh, tradition. And that is that actually we have control over our own mind and our own body. This is where we are sovereign masters and nobody should interfere or should be able to interfere with us. It is those capacities that we can then use to, uh, to actually build a life for ourselves uh, in a new country, for example, like the United States of America, but equally uh, in the United States where John Locke uh, and Adam Smith was Scottish uh, were from. Uh, in terms of in terms of the approach to liberalism, as far as Locke is concerned, uh, Locke uh, did not believe in uh, a innate knowledge. Um, as far as he was concerned, uh, we are born as a blank slate, a tabula rasa on which experience of life is inscribed. Uh, effectively, uh, we become who we are uh, through our experiences, rather than any innate uh, rational uh, uh, capacities and capabilities. Now, uh, Adam Smith, uh, also in terms of his liberalism, uh, believed in uh, individuals uh, making trades, and it's the invisible hand of the market that would steer the best result. So as far as he was concerned is uh, by acting out of self-interest, uh, people will actually uh, arrive at a mutually beneficial result. And uh, this mutual bef beneficial self-interest is because it is based on trade, negotiation and barter. And now here it's where the individuals come to the marketplace to, to exchange uh, uh, services and, and products. Uh, but it is seen that the self-interest is not self-interested self, self in so far as a win-lose situation, but as far as Adam Smith is concerned, he actually believed that this would release a result in a win-win uh, situation. And then, obviously, as inscribed in the in the uh, Declaration of Independence, uh, the meaning of existence is about uh, uh, a free life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And it, it it originates from the individual. It is what the individual can do with his or her life, and how they forge that in the best possible way. Uh, but it is also in relation to others. But the key focus here has always been on the individual and expressing, being able to express their freedom, their liberty, and uh, not being stopped from pursuing their happiness and their aims in life. Another key movement in philosophy uh, in the Enlightenment is Kantianism, uh, which is based on one of the most uh, fundamental uh, philosophers in, in Western uh, philosophy. In fact, uh, uh, I know it was Alfred North Whitehead who mentioned that all philosophy are just footnotes to Plato. Uh, I think philosophy nowadays is actually split between pre-Kantian and post-Kantian, uh, just to signify uh, the significance of Immanuel Kant's uh, influence on Western, uh, Western philosophy ever since. Now, Kant came to philosophy quite late, and it is said that uh, he was influenced by, by Hume and Hume's scepticism in terms of what we can really know about the world, uh, even basic concepts like cause and effect, uh, um, Hume uh, called into question. And, and clearly, Immanuel Kant thought this was uh, this was crazy uh, to not even you know 2,000 years of philosophy, and we couldn't even prove the existence of the external world, or in fact uh, uh, talk about uh, uh, definitive facts and figures. Uh, now that Hume effectively awoke him from his slumbers and uh, uh, his dogmatic slumbers, and he set to actually rectify and base. Uh, his view of the meaning of existence firmly in rationality, in thought, in, in reason. Uh, however, 
uh, he was not uh, bereft of uh, having ethical considerations and most of our ethical thinking and concepts nowadays uh, spring from Kant. My, one particular uh, uh, sentence I, I like is, uh, the heavenly stars above me and the moral law within me fill the mind with ever new and increasing admiration and awe, the more often and steadily we reflect upon them. Uh, it's very clear that uh, he is driven uh, by a pursuit of reason, but he actually believes that we can find the reason for uh, the existence and the meaning of existence in reason rather than in mere intuition. Now, in order to arrive there, uh, as far as Kant is going, he has got the categorical imperative and it has three key formulations. Uh, one is seen as the moral uh, uh, formulation, which, uh, which says, act only according to that maxim whereby you can, at the same time, will that it should become a universal law. Uh, now, many people have described that as, as, you know, very similar to the golden rule, do upon others as you would have done unto yourself. But it's, it's, it's more, more comprehensive than that. What he's actually uh, suggesting is that we should only act in a way that we could become, we could wish to become a universal uh, way for people to operate in the world. Uh, the second uh, categorical imperative is the human uh, formulation, which says, act in such a way that you treat humanity, whether in your own person or in the person of any other, never merely as a means to an end, but always at the same time as an end. And I think that's, uh, as far as Kant is concerned, he is absolutely clear here. We should, of course, we sometimes use people as a means to an end when we go shopping, for example, and the shopping assistance, uh, assistant uh, provides us with the, the products that we want to buy. But we should see them as a person. We should not actually even see them as a shop assistant. We should actually relate to other human people, uh, human beings as people in themselves, not just as an end. And then finally, the autonomy uh, formulation uh, states the idea of the will of every rational being as a universally legislating will. In order for us to become uh, true, true uh, rational agents, we need to have autonomy in the actions that we, uh, we exercise. So only being driven uh, by, by doctrine and dogma would not be seen by Kant as acting autonomously. It would be seen as acting on behalf of scriptures, on edicts, etc. And you would not be able to, you wouldn't be exercising autonomy as a free thinking uh, human being. And uh, it is particularly the last one that uh, he wrote about in a uh, article uh, uh, on uh, what is enlightenment. Now, Sapere order, which is at the top, is also probably the rallying cry to autonomy. Uh, do not accept facts, figures and behaviours uh, at face value, but explore for yourself. Explore for yourself to actually understand uh, your behaviours, your actions and those of others. And then finally, the, the, the goodwill. Uh, Kant was at pains to, to really think about what is the one thing that is a thing in itself rather than a mean, means to an end. And uh, he concluded the only thing he could think of is the goodwill. Because it's a goodwill, it's, a good, it's, it's an attitude to life, it's, a, it's, a, it's a, a willingness to be open to others, to other things and to explore. That is the only thing that is good in itself. And for Kant, goodness is an unmediated essence for goodness' sake. So goodness and goodwill are the thing that are the things in themselves. This is what we should be striving for. This is how we should lead our lives in terms of our attitude uh, to life, to the environment, to others uh, in the world. Utilitarianism is uh, is another key theme, and uh, I've mentioned John Stuart Mill already uh, previously. Uh, it started with uh, Jeremy Bentham, and and Jeremy Bentham has a unique, unique uh, uh, fame, and that is that despite dying in 1832, 
He still sits to this day in King's College, London, in his, in his embalmed uh, body in a case. Unfortunately, the, the head uh, had to be, is now made of plasticine. It, uh, it is now in the Institute of Archaeology for Preservation. But this is a unique, I, I don't think of any uh, other philosopher from the, from the past that is actually still uh, in, embodied uh, in, a, uh, in a university or in a museum. Right, in terms of utilitarianism, it is a very simple principle. Uh, according to Jeremy Bentham, in life uh, there are only two sovereign masters, pleasure and pain. From there, for directly flow from there, the idea of the meaning of existence is to optimize pleasure and to minimize pain. These are the only. This is the only. The only two things that actually are significant in in uh, the meaning of existence. Uh, Bentham goes as far as actually having a happiness or pleasure philosophic calculus, where literally you can add pleasure and subtract pain to see the results the net results of of your actions i think one of the one of the uh, rallying cries from utilitarianism is the greatest happiness for the greatest number now the greatest happiness for the greatest number could either be seen as the wisdom of the crowds or the tyranny of the masses clearly the, if your philosophic calculator shows that uh, a particular group action uh, produces more overall happiness uh, but actually uh, uh, causes significant pain to the minority that would still be seen in Benthian terms as a positive outcome and utilitarianism is often described as consequentialist uh, because it is actually the ends justify the means it's the consequences of an action rather than the action themselves and this is once very uh, contrary to account and uh, the deontology where actually a good will a good motivation good intentions are absolutely critical in order to set you off on the right note uh, before you actually express and uh, your behavior and uh, and carry out your actions this is, take, this is turned on its head in utilitarianism, where actually it is the consequences of your actions that matter rather than the actions and motivations behind them. And then freedom to do whatever gives pleasure. So it is about the individual having the freedom to manifest themselves, to express themselves in the world. It is not until later on with John Stuart Mill where we see a slight uh, amendment to this overarching uh, principle and yes you are allowed to exercise your freedom you, you to seek pleasure uh, as a hedonist or otherwise but you cannot harm others in the process so john stuart mill introduced the the no harm principle uh, to to effectively make sure that uh, the overall overall happiness for everyone is positive uh, rather than negative uh, for the minority and uh, as i mentioned earlier uh, another one of uh, mill's key concept is that uh, the individual is sovereign over his his or her own body and mind but that does not mean that they have any right to interfere with the mind or body of other people even to the extent when other people aim to do themselves harm we do not have a moral ethical right to intervene the only time we would have an ethical right to intervene is if these people were not seen to be rational agents so for example minors uh, maybe uh, uh, people in mental institutions etc would be exempt from this particular rule but otherwise we have no right to interfere uh, with other people Another key strand in life is in philosophy are the concepts of nihilism and pessimism. And here we find uh, two uh, very uh, important German philosophers, uh, Friedrich Nietzsche 
and Arthur Schopenhauer, uh, who who have a very different take on the meaning of existence. As far as Schopenhauer is concerned, it is really the world is represented to us by a universal or general will, and all we see is its representation. And we, the will is blind and it's craving. It is constantly, uh, constantly uh, compelling us to actually want goods, services, food in our life. We're never resting. We're always restless, looking to have the next thing, driven on by this uh, general will. And as far as Schopenhauer is concerned, the, the only escape from this meaningless existence is benevolence for others and art and particular music, where the, we can break out of this cycle of always wanting more. And existence itself is meaningless. So this is where the nihilism comes in. You know, we need to reach beyond ourselves, the ego, to others, uh, to be selfless. And it's very clear here to actually see a link to uh, Eastern thought, uh, which we discussed in a previous lecture. For example, the Bhagavad Gita, which is much more around actually not us as ourselves as individuals, but our our uh, responsibilities, our duties uh, to the community. Uh, to our station in life and uh, ultimately uh, to the overall realization that Atman and Brahman uh, are the universal uh, same. And as I mentioned earlier, the escape, the only escape really is, is to be uh, benevolent towards others and uh, immerse yourself in activities which uh, where the cessation of craving is prevalent particularly in, in such things like music. Now, in terms of, in terms of uh, uh, Nietzsche, uh, he was initially a follower of Schopenhauer and admired Schopenhauer, but then uh, I think uh, saw him as somewhat too pessimistic. Uh, and, and, and he then went off and uh, developed his own uh, concept of the will, which we discuss uh, very shortly uh, in, a, in a little while. Now, as far as Nietzsche is concerned, existence has no objective meaning uh, or no universal meaning. And in gay science uh, is the famous saying is that God is dead and we have killed him. Uh, in a later book, Zarathustra, the, the prophet, uh, it also uh, talks about this and actually it's very clear that in the absence of universal uh, edicts such as uh, such as religion there are no absolute values which we can uh, which we can follow and as far as Nietzsche is concerned these highest values and by highest values he means these absolute universal values they are devaluing themselves because we no longer believe in in God. And the question of what is the meaning of life or why or the meaning of existence finds no answer. We, we, we cannot find an absolute answer because the one thing that is absolute or was absolute in our life, which is the divine, we have we have killed. We have we have done away with uh, in the in the age of enlightenment, and uh, and uh, this is a key issue for for Nietzsche. Some people interpret Nietzsche to sort of suggest that actually this is something that that he sees as a positive movement because of his uh, view of uh, Christianity uh, as a slave morality. But I think that's that would be misinterpreted. I think Nietzsche himself is upset that we have nothing to hold on to. And that it's up to us to actually make sense of the meaning of existence. The only way to do that is to actually affirm life, is to actually optimize your potential, is probably the best way of thinking about uh, Nietzsche. Um, it is about taking hold of our lives, doing something with it, rather than just following the crowd. That is how we create meaning. We create meaning in our own life, through our own actions, through our own attitudes and our own behaviours. Now, the example 
The example that Nietzsche gives is that of the camel, the lion and the child. Uh, as, according to Nietzsche, we are all born beasts of burden, just carrying our various prejudices, opinions on, on our backs. And it's not until uh, we cry out like the lion, roaring out like the lion, enough is enough. I, I will no longer just be moving along in this life with others, following others without thinking, that we can return and become the child. A child that is maybe naive, but also curious about the world and trying to explore the world all afresh from the beginning in a way that makes sense to us rather than just accept accepting uh, perceived wisdom. And then finally, this concept is brought to bear in uh, the will to power and the superman or the ubermensch. And you know, clearly uh, uh, Nietzsche is, is not uh, regarding this as, as seizing power politically or seizing, uh, seizing uh, power uh, by being uh, a supernatural force. What he, I think, is talking about is actually the commitment uh, uh, to self-realization and self-actualization, to make the most of one's talents and capabilities and see them through to the end. This is a constant life of, of trying to uh, become the best we can. Another key movement in philosophy in the late uh, 19th and 20th century was phenomenology. Again, a, a couple of philosophers here. One was Edmund Husserl and the other one was Martin Heidegger. And uh, as for Husserl is the, is the uh, initial proponent of phenomenology. And phenomenology is really about not uh, looking at the object of our perception but the subject perceiving the object and what that means uh, that's a, it's, it's an interesting way of, of looking at things in a different way it's, it's it's i suppose it's very similar to the idea of the difference between consciousness and self-consciousness uh, you know seeing seeing this laptop right here at the moment is consciousness uh, having thoughts about what it means to be on this laptop giving this lecture is self-consciousness and it, it provides a difference of state of consciousness and it's that is the latter that phenomenology was really interested in in exploring in in more detail now uh, phenomenology key concepts uh, by Husserl include things like intentionality so that's not uh, just uh, you know uh, wanting to do something deliberately intentionality is much more about uh, uh, aboutness you know life is all about aboutness when we think, we think about something or about someone. If we think, if we want something, it's always about wanting something rather than just wanting. And it's that intentionality that uh, Husserl explores in terms of what that means for us as a human being. And we're always out uh, on the search uh, for meaning in our our lives. And it is a process, as far as Husserl is concerned, through which we actually find meaning uh, by actually experiencing the world. He also coined two, uh, two um, key notions, uh, such as epoche and disclosure. Now, the epoche is a bit, I think he calls it bracketing. And to some extent, it's a suspension of judgment. Uh, it's not actually coming to a conclusion prematurely, but actually weighing up, and this is going back to ancient Greek, weighing up both sides of an argument and, and giving room not to crystallize our thoughts, but actually leaving space for the potential 
uh, for the for the sort of disclosure to happen. By keeping an open mind, uh, we will be able to see things differently rather than categorizing them right at the outside into into something that is an object with certain uh, parameters and and uh, uh, dimensions. And by having this suspension of judgment. Uh, you know, things will be disclosed to us because we're keeping the potentialities uh, of the situation alive. And as far as Husserl is concerned, really it is the, the life world that is the fundamental. We are constantly engaged in the world and actually how we are engaged in the world gives it meaning. Our, our behaviours, our thoughts, uh, our actions, are all part and our interactions with other is what gives the world meaning and it what gives our existence meaning. Now Heidegger takes a lot of that and and works with that but he takes it from a very very uh, different perspective. You know the one thing that he would accuse uh, Husserl of that uh, this all sounds far too abstract. This seems to be you know a, a scientific way of chipping away at the meaning of things uh, and coming up with abstract concepts rather than concrete examples. Now, as far as Heidegger is concerned, is that actually it is all about us as an individual and a collective humanity. Uh, he starts off by saying that we're thrown into a pre-existing world which we have not chosen, which we weren't aware of previously, and we then are projecting ourselves towards the future, the horizon. And this horizon is given to us already by the social conventions that are there. So he would call this first one our, our factual existence, facticity. He would call our projection in the world uh, our fallenness, because we are projecting ourselves as part of uh, social norms and conventions rather than our own thoughts and deliberations. And we then come to our transcendence, which is the space where we can contemplate, evaluate uh, different potential potentialities, uh, choose the, the right one and move on. Uh, now, as far as Heidegger is concerned, the key concept here is Dasein. And Dasein, literally translated from the German, is actually, it's, it means uh, uh, being there. It can also be my existence. Um, and for Heidegger, we are the animal, the creature, the entity for which our being is an issue. What he's saying is actually how we are, what our human nature is, what the meaning of our existence is, is an, is an issue for us as, as the creature we are, I human, uh, which is not seen uh, in other creatures and therefore it warrants deep exploration. Now for, for, for Heidegger, being in the world is very very important actually how we are in the world and how we interact in the world is 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 significant and uh, here he introduces the concept of authenticity are we are we simply dragged along by the world and social conventions and uh, he would call that uh, a being a dasman a dasman means uh, is a a, a a neuter term uh, for for a human uh, you know, it's, it's, it's somebody who is passive, somebody who's been dragged along, not really expressing themselves, not really trying to find out uh, who he or she uh, is or could become. But being in the world is actually a journey of authenticity, about understanding that actually it's our finitude that makes it important for us to, to find our authenticity and act accordingly. Uh, and that is also uh, uh, discovered uh, in terms of being with, being with others in the world and being towards. Now, being towards is a very critical element for, for Heidegger. Our finitude means that actually we're always being towards death. And it's that realization uh, that our finitude is absolute will help us 
to lead our life in a more authentic and more purposeful way. So, in a, in a summary for phenomenology, the meaning of existence is one of being and becoming. It is about being an authentic individual, uh, being someone who is autonomous, going back to Kant, uh, and someone who is, is, is willing to explore the world and be open to the world. And by doing that is by actually changing uh, the way uh, they express themselves and what they seek. So the meaning of existence is the interplay between a state of being and the process of becoming. Now, sometimes uh, people would categorize Heidegger in particular as also an existentialist, uh, which <laughs> he, he personally always rejected. I suppose uh, the godfather of uh, of existentialism is actually Kierkegaard, uh, who actually uh, defined our existence as utter freedom. And uh, we're coming on to that. Utter freedom in the way we lead our life. This freedom makes us dizzy because we, we know that uh, we have all the choices to make all the choices we have to make ourselves. There's no one else to help us to make these choices. And this actually is causes us anxiety uh, and gives us dizziness, something that we find just too beyond us to contemplate and to have to deal with. And uh, as far as uh, he's concerned, we can lead one of three lives. We can lead the ethical life, we can lead the aesthetic life, or we can uh, live the theistic life. And uh, uh, his famous, this famous uh, saying is that life is, is lived forward, but it can only be understood backwards. In order to go through life, because we have personal responsibility for this, every choice we make is a decision point and that's what's causing anxiety uh, but sometimes we don't have rational arguments in terms of uh, why we intuitively feel that uh, one thing is a better thing to do than another and and uh, Kierkegaard describes the, um, the leap of faith very simply as an example with Abraham and uh, and Isaac when uh, Abraham took him up, up, Isaac up to the mountain to sacrifice his own son, and it was only at the last minute that uh, uh, an angel stayed uh, uh, Abraham's arm. Now, most of us would say, "No, this is this is madness," and uh, clearly not a good example of a leap of faith. Uh, as far as Kierkegaard was concerned, as far as he, he wanted to really demonstrate, is that actually there are things in life that we don't know the consequences of. We don't know the full picture. We don't know the unfolding story. And therefore, we should make a leap into something, not the unknown, but something that we are not absolutely certain about. When we come probably to the most famous existentialist, uh, Jean-Paul Sartre, uh, French philosopher in the 20th century, uh, you know, as far as he, he takes a lot of uh, Kierkegaard's uh, uh, construct in terms of utter freedom. Now for, and, you know, and most of the philosophy that, uh, that Jean-Paul Sartre started was actually in the Second World War. He was obviously also alive in the First World War, but it was really in terms of freedom under oppression and occupation. Even then, you know, as far as uh, uh, Jean-Paul Sartre was concerned, we are responsible for our own uh, freedom. We are responsible for our own actions, and effectively, we become uh, who uh, we become the choices we make. His famous book, Being and Nothingness, is is really uh, pointing towards uh, a state of being, which he again uh, relays to, to, to Heidegger in terms of our bare existence, our, our, our sort of inauthenticity, uh, and then 
our potential in terms of doing something. But the being and nothingness. The nothingness is the not yet. The not yet that doesn't exist. It is something for us to create. The future doesn't exist and it is up to us to furnish that with content. That's very important. Now, uh, with uh, uh, Camus, another existentialist, we find uh, a, a definition of life that isn't meaningless, but is absurd. Uh, you know, there's no, there's no structure to life. Life just happens. Uh, and he quotes the myth of Syphysis as a perfect example of absurdity. Syphysis uh, actually uh, was supposed to be taken by, by Hades into, into the underworld. Uh, and uh, and uh, Hades wanted to chain Sisyphus. But Sisyphus persuaded Hades to try out the chains first on himself, at which point he became a prisoner and, uh, and Sisyphus uh, continued his life. Now clearly the other Greek gods couldn't let this happen. Uh, uh, Hades was freed, uh, Sisyphus was enchained, and the punishment for his affront was that he had to push a huge rock up a mountain only for the rock when he got to the top to fall back down again and he had to return to the rock and push it back uphill. Now the, the message for, for from Camus really is that even in that life of absurdity where your whole entire existence feels like pushing a rock uphill only for it to be re returning uh, back to its base, we can find meaning and that meaning is, is actually being engaged in the very process of activity, of that pushing that rock, um, which again is, is a typical existentialism in terms of taking responsibility uh, for our own action. And then uh, uh, Maurice Merleau-Ponty, another French existentialist, we're condemned to be free. You know, we are. This is our condemnation. This is not something that is positive because we therefore are the architects of our future. We can't blame anybody, we can't congratulate anybody else but ourselves for the actions and the choices uh, we make in life. Yes, and the other thing is that in that, in that uh, freedom, we try to find meaning. Now, the existentialists aren't saying that life is meaningless. And some of them are definitely saying that life is absurd and, and, and the meaning of existence is an absurd state and process to be in. But I think the point that is being made is that actually we are wired as humans to explore, to find meaning in things. And as I mentioned earlier, our existence and the meaning of our existence really uh, is the outcome of the choices we make. So the way we lead our lives and how we progress through the, the journey of life is fundamental. But it is up to us to make the most of it rather than uh, relying on others. We're coming towards the end. I want to sort of focus on a couple of other ones, and I think one of them is uh, is logical positivism and uh, analytic philosophy, uh, going relatively quickly. Uh, I think also the key proponents of this uh, were the Vienna Circle philosophers like Carnap, Schlick, Neurath, and also, although he was only not really part of the Vienna Circle. The early Wittgenstein, the one of the Tractatus, uh, was also very much interested in, in the analytical side of philosophy. Now, all of these really uh, came to this from uh, the philosophy and mathematics of Gottlob Frege, uh, who, whose quest in life was to reduce language and logic really uh, to mathematics, to actually find uh, logical notations through mathematics to actually describe the world in general uh, through language. Uh, in his book Begrisschaft, 
biggest shift he explored different types of logic that actually you could reduce uh, logical statements to notations which could then be used to actually develop like mathematical uh, formulas now the Vienna circle certainly thought that the meaning of existence is a meaningless question because how can you ask a question like that um, it is it, there's no meaning you can only have facts you can't have facts you can't have suppositions so to, for something to have meaning it would need to be its own uh, its own piece of language it would effectively be the meaning of meaning and uh, you would in, you sort of incur an infinite regress uh, which as they thought was was illogical and and clearly uh, a misuse of of logic and language so therefore the meaning of existence didn't bother them it's not something that uh, the logical positivists would have explored in any uh, shape or form uh, but uh, the only way to arrive at truths is actually through the very determined application of logical constructs and processes as far as uh, 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 Wittgenstein in the Tractatus uh, is concerned uh, he takes a similar picture uh, rather than mathematics he he believes that the limit of his language is the limit of his world so what he cannot express in language he cannot express at all in fact if he encountered something that he could not describe in language it would be meaningless now that doesn't mean that Wittgenstein thought there was no other things other than language or logic he believed there were lots of other things that were what he would describe as mystical but they are outside the word world of logic and language and and his final final uh, famous uh, uh, statement in the tractatus is of what one not can speak therefore therefore thereof one has to remain silent and as far as Willard van Orman Quine is concerned he believes that actually uh, language is a social endeavor and it is dependent on shared understanding and context through experience so language itself is not binary you know when we describe certain words they can have different interpretations they can have different meanings they can have different contexts uh, but certainly the the meaning of of existence in terms of our shared understanding of the world is through shared experiences from which these meanings arise i want to finish off uh, briefly on on humanism and there we have a, a interpretation of the meaning of existence in terms of evolution and from an evolutionary point of view the meaning of existence is the preservation and propagation of life uh, and uh, that is clear that we have a genetic inheritance which we pass on to to the next generation and uh, the so that is a meaning of our existence uh, that doesn't necessarily mean that uh, we are determined by our genes although some uh, humanists would argue this but actually that it predisposes us to actually be uh, be following life in a certain way and uh, it puts restrictions on our potentiality uh, but the way we exercise our existence is still seen to be within our purview uh, the difference is that meaning isn't an emotional intu intu intuitive uh, concept but is actually discovered through rational scientific inquiry so this this brings out uh, very clear notions um, and such as such as truth progress and improvement these are also of enlightenment type of ideals so in humanism there is definitely a direction of travel there is there is an idea of the potential for perfection 
of improvement and, and continuous uh, moving forward uh, in terms of the individual, but also in terms of a society. When we come to uh, things like transhumanism, uh, that is that's a very different type of approach. It basically means that we should not we should not limit our future capabilities and capacities uh, by limiting us to our body and actually enhancing our body or augmenting our bodies with technology to become uh, faster and smarter and stronger is something that is seen as a natural progression in evolution. Posthumanism is is again a, an interesting concept uh, which which has two I suppose distinct uh, meanings. In terms of philosophical terms, it means that actually reaching beyond the human into a wider philosophical context that include things like the environment and and green uh, philosophy, uh, but also uh, other sentient creatures. Uh, etc in terms of rights responsibilities and so on uh, in the more technological point of view it actually suggests a, a move uh, that is beyond the physical embodiment uh, where you know we could upload our consciousness into into the into the ether into the internet into into computers and uh, you know work is going on with uh, with various uh, uh, billionaires, including Elon Musk, to to see whether we could ever get to this. And uh, I'm not sure how many of you have seen the film Transcendence, where Johnny Depp uh, is trying to attempt exactly that, and uh, uh, with interesting results. And then finally. Uh, the human personality really describes the purpose of his existence. So I think in terms of humanism, uh, our makeup, our physical genetic makeup already uh, tells us, has a sort of kernel, has the seed of what our meaning of existence is. Uh, and ultimately, uh, we come back uh, to uh, the preservation and propagation of life of the next generation uh, to improve the, the gene pool, so to speak. And the meaning of existence in humanism is seeking happiness in this life, because uh, human, humanists believe there is only this life, and helping others to do the same. So, I hope you enjoyed this particular lecture, and I just want to share with you very briefly uh, what's coming up next on the final lecture of this series. We start off with the problems of philosophy. Now Bertrand Russell wrote a very important but little book called The Problems of Philosophy, covering the main issues that are of concern in philosophy, such as knowledge, truth, reality and universals. As far as I'm concerned, that's a misnomer. I want to actually cover the problems with philosophy because I actually fundamentally believe there are several uh, issues with philosophy and particular around certain constructs and particular concepts and questions that uh, philosophy is asking and, and certain sort of accepted points of departure which are taken for granted, which I believe are actually causing a lot of the, the issues. I'm a bit like uh, the, the Wittgenstein who believes that if we formulated the questions rather differently, it would be not too difficult to unknot a lot of the knots of philosophy. Uh, and what, having, having been uh, hubristic enough to, to do that, I then want to share with you a different way forward, a new uh, lived philosophy, which I would call, term as relationality. And there I want to talk uh, about relationality and what it means in itself. I want to talk about key concepts like connectivity in, in the world, our interactivity with others and our interdependence in the world, which leads to the emergence of, of new positive, uh, positive and negative manifestations uh, and transitions where we move from one state of the world to another. I want to take you through my take on the concepts 
of being and becoming in an overall ecosystem and biosphere. And I want to finish off uh, the series by talking to you about the concept of care and how that can have a significant impact and influence in terms of uh, how we lead our lives. So I hope you enjoy this lecture. I thank you for listening and I hope to see you next time. All the very best.